Hi, I'm DJ Ware. This week on the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be talking about free and open source software. Stay tuned right after this. So I, I guess I guess we need to talk about this subject. There's there's some people that are that have been doing videos on YouTube, and uh, I'm just going to put my two cents in here too. I had some experience with this um, in my previous job, where the company, one of the groups in our company, had actually violated the FOSS license, where they had taken software, modified it, and didn't put it back into the community. And it was a it was a GPL license that they violated, so they got into some trouble. And of course, you know, corporations being what corporations are, if you don't punish the guilty, you punish everybody else. Uh, so <clears throat> they mandated that if you're going to use FOSS, you'll have to get approval before you're allowed to use it. It took them about, I would guess, pretty much eight months, maybe a year, almost, where they restricted us from using any kind of FOSS software. Uh, and that have forced us to have to go back and write code uh, in order to make up the deficiency in like Log4j, for example, I mean, which is open source. So we couldn't use anything until this group got them, themselves in place, got their policies up and running, and then we would then submit our pieces of code to them. And then, of course, they, had, they were coin operated, so they had to get a piece of the pie too in order to be able to do all that. But uh, yeah, it, it, it is, I'm not, not trying to minimize it, it is a very sticky wicket when you're dealing with free and open source software. Uh, and let's talk about some of the things you can run into with it. So first of all, what does free and open source mean? What, what does it actually mean? So free means freedom, not payment. It doesn't mean that uh, you receive payment for that free software, it means it means, it, it means that you never have to pay for the software because you certainly can run into software that is free and open source that you have to license for money. Uh, it just means that you have the freedom. You have the freedom to use it in the way that you want, modify it the way you want, look at the source code the way that you want, and learn from it. Open source means that the source code has to be made available to everyone. Uh, yeah, you can't discriminate. You have to give it away to everyone. Otherwise, it's not open source. Proprietary software is something that we usually talk about when we're talking about software such as Windows or Mac OS, but neither one of those are strictly closed source. <laughs> They're hybrid. I mean, both of them have pieces of open source code in them. Uh, but it means generally that it's non-free software, meaning that I cannot do whatever I want to with it. I can't take Windows and redistribute it as something else. Microsoft would probably come after me, and I can't do the same thing with Mac OS. I can't take Mac OS and redistribute it. In fact, in both cases, the companies have legally pursued such individuals in, in over history that have attempted to do that. Um, <clears throat> but it means that uh, that the, the publisher of that software, Apple or Microsoft, uh, as an example, they, they retain exclusive rights to use, modify, share it as they will, share the software and either make the source code available or not at their, at their uh, whim. So we talk about this as being copyrighted or patented in software. So copyright, which is kind of a funny name because it's actually copy restricted. It means that you are not free to do as you will with it. You're not free to, to just take it out and make as many copies of the software as you like. And you're not free to take what they're doing, reverse engineer it and turn it into a piece of code that you wrote. So yeah, proprietary can be copyrighted. It can be patented. It can be both. It could be a hybrid. It could be partially open source, partly patented, partly copyrighted. Yeah, it gets very sticky when you get into this kind of a situation here. Public domain software has a different meaning. Originally, public domain software would usually have been software that was produced by taxpayer dollars. That was the original definition of it when, when I was uh, growing up in the industry. And uh, it has changed. I mean, it, it is no longer, that is no longer true. But public domain software is any software that has no legal copyright or editing restrictions. So 
It's free. The source code is available. It can be publicly modified, distributed. It can be sold even uh, without any restrictions. There are a number of packages that are out today that, that basically subscribe to the public software domain model, and that is SQLite I2P. Uh, CERN has a number of their packages that they have written and developed that are available on their website that are are under a public domain software license. Copy Left was the original Free Software Foundation's uh, model for uh, both determining open free and open source and also determining how it could be marketed, how it could be licensed, and second of all, uh, who was actually fully compliant with their specification. So copy left is the practice of granting rights. So you explicitly are granting, not restricting. You're granting rights to freely distribute and modify with the requirement that those same rights that you have, that as, as, as say I'm a public, uh, let's say I am an open source author. I write some more open source code. I put it out there. If somebody picks it up and they put it in a derivative work that they charge for and it's closed source. Well, they cannot uh, they cannot take over and claim ownership of my software ever. Uh, they can, otherwise, they have to remove it. So. Debian was early on uh, in one of the pioneers that helped shape what open free and open source software actually meant. They started out with a the Debian social so contract, and there was five points to it. So, and Debian will remain 100% free, free as in <laughs> free to use, not uh, the freedom to use the software, not that it would be 100% free. I don't think now that may mean that they would never charge for their software. I, yeah, but uh, originally it did not mean that, but I think it does today. So, and they will give back to, uh, to free to the software community. So in other words, without it, it, because it's open source, they're willing to put any changes that they make to it back into the community pool. The other one, which is a big one, is they won't hide any problems. So if they have security flaws or they run into bugs or things that cause you know the thing to, to go boom in the night, they won't hide the fact that that happened. They'll, they'll freely admit, hey, we're working on it, we're gonna fix it. And, and that has been their case for as many years as I have, have been around that group. Uh, they have always been transparent about any of those kinds of issues. They've also been very fast about trying to fix them. Uh, you know, depending upon the complexity of the problem, it takes what it takes to fix. You can't always guarantee, well, I'll have this done in 24 hours. You can't guarantee things like that. Um, but our priorities are, are to the users and to free software. That's they're, they're dedicated to both of those. But it, it doesn't mean that you restrict that I'm only going to offer software that is, is free. So that's what the fifth point means is that is works that don't meet their software standards, they'll still provide a way that you can include them. And they do that. Uh, Debian does do that. Fedora does too. Um, they provide the non-free and contributed uh, uh, repositories that so that you can add them on if you want code that you cannot distribute. It might be it might be uh, proprietary software. It might be uh, maintained. But even the Linux kernel has some of that. In fact, the Linux kernel has some code in it that is classified. Believe it or not, uh, like uh, some of the contributions from some of the large companies. Um, have marked some of the code where they are not allowed to even talk about what's in it. So now I'm not talking about governmental entities. I'm talking about corporate entities because it's 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 proprietary to their particular piece of hardware. So yeah, <laughs> don't, don't don't get me wrong. Not talking about the, that. The second half that Debian did was they established the free software guidelines, and that was started by Brian Peterson when he was in charge of the project. So there's uh, 10 points here that they uh, have come up with. And, and those 10 points are also, you'll find, not word for word, but they're similar in the Open Source Initiative. The Open Source Initiative adopted the Debian Free Software Guidelines, or DFSG, and incorporated them into their side of things. So is this the only way you can define open source? No. No. This is the first way open source was defined. So... It means that, first of all, uh, it, you're free to redistribute. So um, 
<clears throat> you're, you're free to redistribute as long as any changes you make go back into the community. So you can't restrict it. You can't say, oh, this is only going to go to a certain group of people. You can't do that. Source code has to be included or at least made available to it. Um, one of the other requirements of that is that the, uh, so does the binaries. The binaries come with it too. Now I've noticed that there are some companies that are not including the binaries today that even though they are using Debian <laughs> to do uh, to distribute their uh, software, but um, for as far as the packages are concerned inside of Debian, yeah, they are. Okay. Derived works, that uh, derived work cannot change the fact that your package that you wrote is open source. They can't change that. Uh, also, the integrity of the author's source code has to be maintained. In other words, if I make a change to it, I got to give it back to you. Now, you may not decide to use it. It may not be of any value to you. It might be something that was only value to them. But yeah, they have to provide that to you. Uh, you cannot discriminate against persons or groups. You also can't discriminate against fields of endeavor. So in other words, um, I can't say this, sort, this free and open source software is only for this group of people. You can't do that. You also can't say it's only for this group of businesses. Uh, yeah, so you can't do that. So. Uh, that would, def and these have been around a long time. This is nothing new. So I don't want you to think that this is something they just added in. They didn't. They thought about this 30 years ago. The distribution of the license uh, has to be maintained so that, you know, it, no matter where it goes, that it goes with it. License cannot be specific to Debian. Now, that's a specific thing to Debian. So in other words, that if Ubuntu wants to use it or Linux Mint wants to use it, that's fine with Debian. Uh, Linux must, uh, the license must not contaminate other software. In other words, it can't be given a broader scope. So if the software is proprietary to begin with, the scope of the license can only be to the component that is, uh, has, is under, let's say it's a GPL version two. That particular code can only be GPL version two. The rest of the code remains whatever license it is. So you can't taint it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and there are some examples of licenses that uh, that Debian considers free, and those are the GPL, BSD, and Artistic. Now, BSD has a little bit different licensing strategy uh, in that it has to do with when they grew up. They grew up in the middle of the Unix lawsuit craze, Unix trademark. Uh, yeah, you have to say Unix trademark because Unix is a trademark, and if you use it outside of that, if, if BSD, for example, were to say they're Unix, they would be sued immediately. So that's one of the things that they were trying to avoid. They didn't want to put any restrictions on their software whatsoever. You are not required when you're using, Deb, uh, using BSD, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, you are not required if you're using a BSD license to put your modifications back in. You can do whatever the heck you want with it. You can, you can uh, change it to your heart's content. You can sell it. You can do whatever you want. BSD does not restrict the licensing at all. Some of the open source initiative took those ten points from Debian, and they, I mean they reworded some things, but the basic meaning is still in their open source initiative document. You can go to their website and read it. Uh, it's it's pretty much line for line for what Debian did as far as intent is con is concerned, but the OSI has gone a step further. They have also provided you a list of those things they have approved as being OSI compliant, right? Uh, the Apache License 2.0, BSD3, to the GNU Public General Public License, the Lesser uh, General Public License, the MIT License, Mozilla. Even the common development and distribution license they have approved. Uh, Eclipse Public License version 2.0 is also in there as well. So there's a bunch more licenses. That's not the only ones. These are the ones that are generally uh, approved. I mean, in other words, that you'll, they're common. You'll find a lot of people using these licenses. But there are other licenses that are general purpose, not so common. Some of them have been superseded but they're still around. You'll still find them in, in code that is not maintained very well. 
So they have a list on their site. So if you're interested in seeing that, it was just too long a list for me to provide here to you. It's just they would go on for days. The final question, is free and open source different? Is, if it's free software and it's open source software, is that different? The definition, this is according to the judge that ruled against the company that I work for. No, <laughs> free and open source, there's no difference. It, it means the same thing. It is generally accepted in the industry that that is true as well. So one final thought. If you're, if you're making up your mind about a piece of software, maybe you're a person that says, I won't use anything that isn't free and open source software. Be careful, because when you're evaluating software, you, you can't just go look at the license for, say, it's a it's a Apache uh, web server, the HTTP server. You bring it down, you look at the license, an Apache 2 license, you read the Apache 2 license, it looks good to you, good, off to the race as you go. Uh, hold up a minute. You need to evaluate the entire software bill of materials. The, and what do I mean by that? So there is a chain of packages that make up the Apache HTTP server. Log4j is one of those. So you need to make sure that your list includes all of the software that is built, that is built alongside to create the Apache HTTP server. But you can't stop there. You also, if you, when you encounter Log4j and you get its license, you're gonna find it too has a software bill of materials. You have to keep going. Yeah, it's turtles all the way down, all the way down. So it gets complicated, it gets expensive, and it gets time consuming to do that. So yeah, be careful when you, when you say, oh, this is fine, this is open source, this is great. Uh, you might have a license under there that has nothing to do with the Apache license. It might be a uh, Mozilla license. It might be an Apple license. It might be a Microsoft license. So yeah, be careful of what you're doing there because you could get yourself wrapped around the axles again, get, your, get the car wrapped around a tree. So yeah, you, you might be surprised at the number of licenses and the, and the differences in those licenses that you'll encounter. So yeah, just that's all I'm saying. That, that's all I'm gonna say. So. Uh, I hope you, <laughs> hope you enjoyed this. This is a complicated topic. Uh, at me personally, what is my feelings on free and open source? I prefer that, but I'm not limited to that software. I, I prefer to look for something that satisfies my need. And I don't care if it's free and open source. If that is the best solution, and it's not always, to be honest, um, that I will use proprietary software when and if I need to use that. So, yeah, I don't. I, I look for a best of breed approach. I don't. I don't try to just stay inside of. Oh, I'm only going to use free and open source. No, no, that's that's crazy talk. Um, you may only have a half a solution there if you're only using free and open source software. And if you're the other way and you're only going to use proprietary software you may be paying more for software that you don't need to that provides something that your particular proprietary version doesn't give to you. So yeah, uh, and it is interesting how many proprietary pieces of software, Mac, OS, Windows, have open source components in them. So, and Apple is mandated to keep a, a repository site open that has those per, those pieces of software in it that contain open source because any changes they make, again, have to go back to the community that wrote it. So Microsoft is under the same rules. So yeah, they all have to play by the same game. Otherwise, they'll be in trouble. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like and subscribe. See you all next time. Bye for now.